G'day everyone and welcome to this video. This is going to be the start of a series of videos where we work together to create a first person game in the Unity game engine. While some elements of this series are targeted towards creating more of a first person shooter, there are many skills that we will learn that can be applied to any kind of first person game. We'll cover topics ranging from interaction to enemy AI, dynamic music, post processing and a whole bunch more. In this video, we're going to create our own character controller using Unity's new input system. I'm really excited to share this process with you, so let's get straight to it. In a new project, let's begin by creating a capsule, and we'll rename this to Player. Over in the Inspector, we'll assign it the Player tag as well. We'll delete the Capsule Collider, and we'll add in a character controller. Now let's grab our main camera and parent it to the Player game object and we'll set its position to be 0 on the x-axis, 0.6 on the y-axis, and 0 on the z-axis. This will position the camera around about where our player's eyes should be. Now we'll head down into the project window, create a new folder, and call this prefabs. And we'll create a prefab for our player by dragging our player game object into that folder. Now we want to import the input system, so let's head up to window, and we'll open up the package manager. We want to navigate to the packages kept in the Unity registry, so then we can scroll down and import the input system. We'll get this warning popping up asking if we want to disable the old input manager. For this video, we're going to build our controller from the ground up, so we want to hit yes, and this will restart Unity. And we'll make sure that we save our scene before the program restarts. Now, not all games will need to use the new input system. For simple control schemes, you can get away with just using Unity's built-in input manager. But there are a lot of great features that come with the new input system that allow us to easily create professional control schemes. And we'll cover a lot of these as we move through the series. And once Unity is back up and running, we can close the package manager and we'll head over into assets. In here, we'll create a new folder called input. And inside that folder, we'll right click, go create, and all the way down the bottom here, we've got our input actions. So let's create a new input actions, and we'll call this player input. If we double click and open that, it'll open up a new window, which is our action editor window. And you can see that this window is divided into three sections. We've got action maps, actions, and properties. So first up, let's look at action maps. An action map is a set of actions that the player can do depending on the current state of the game. For example, we could have an action map called on foot, and this would contain every action that the player could do while walking around. Then if we had a driving mechanic in our game and we want our character to jump in the car and speed off, we would need to create a new action map and we can call this driving. This action map would contain a whole new set of actions and properties. For now, we'll just focus on creating a basic action map for our player. So let's get rid of driving and we'll just keep on foot. So if we select on foot, we can see that in our actions tab, we have a new action here. So let's start by setting up our player's movement action. We can rename this new action here to movement. And if we open this up, we can see that it currently has no bindings. An action can have multiple bindings in order for it to be triggered and we can add a new binding by clicking the plus button up here, which will bring up a list of different bindings to choose from. Or if we right click on the action, we can see that the list includes one more option, and that is a 2D vector composite. This will return a vector two that has been normalized between negative one and one, so it's great for any kind of directional input. So let's add that in there, and we can see that it already has spots where we can set up bindings for up, down, left, and right. This first 2D vector we'll use for our WASD keys. And in order for it to work with our gamepad as well, we can just duplicate this action and rename it to left stick. Lastly, we'll delete this empty binding up the top here because we don't need that. Now let's look at the properties tab. This is where we can set up the key bindings to trigger an action. We'll start by setting up the keyboard bindings for our movement action here. We want the up direction to be assigned to W on the keyboard, and we can just search that by typing it into the drop down menu here. We want down to be set to S. We want left to be set to A, and we want right to be set to D. Now we can do the same thing for our left stick. For our up direction, we want that to be set to left stick up, 
And we want to make sure that we select gamepad for all of these ones so that we're not targeting a specific device. We will be targeting all gamepads that are compatible with Unity. Down we want set to left stick down. Left will be left stick left. And right we want to set to left stick right. Okay, so that's all of the bindings set up for our movement action. Now let's go ahead and create a new action and this will be for our jump. So let's call it jump. And again, we want two bindings for this action. So we'll create a new binding by pressing the plus button on the action itself and we'll just select add binding. The first binding we want to set to space and the second binding we want to set to button south on the gamepad. So again, this is really handy because we're not actually targeting a specific controller. Instead, button south will just return the lowest button on the right hand side of a controller. So A for an Xbox, B for Switch, and cross for PlayStation. Now at the top of the action editor window, you can see that there is a little asterisk next to our player input. This is because our asset hasn't been saved yet. So we can click save asset and then head over into the inspector and hit generate C sharp class. We'll click apply and that will create a C sharp class that we can reference from inside of our scripts. Now, if we look at the player input action, we open this up down here. You can see that we've got two extra sub files here. We've got one for on foot jump and one for on foot movement. So any new actions that we add into our action map here will also be created as a subfile of our input actions asset. Okay, so that is all we're gonna be doing with the action editor for the moment. We can go ahead and head back to our scene view. And while we're here, we might as well set up a little scene. So I'll just quickly set up a floor and some cubes to surround the player. And I'm just gonna dim the light a little bit as well. All right, with that done, we'll head into our assets folder and we'll create a new folder for our scripts. In here, we wanna create a new C-sharp script and we'll call this input manager. And this script will essentially be a central point where we can channel all of our inputs through. At the top of the script, we'll make sure that we're using unityengine.input system. We're going to set up some values at the top of the class here. We want a private player input and we'll call this player input. And this is a reference to the C sharp class that we just generated. Next, we want to have a private player input dot on foot actions. And this is a reference to, of course, the on foot action map. So we'll name this on foot. Next, we want to change start to awake. And in here, we want to create a new instance of our player input class. So player input is equal to new player input and on foot is equal to player input dot on foot. Now, in order for us to use any of these inputs, we need to enable our action map. So we can do this in on enable. We'll type in private void on enable. And all we need to do is call enable on our on foot actions. We want to do the same with disable. So private void on disable and then on foot dot disable. Now we'll save that script, head back into unity. Just realized I popped my prefabs folder inside the scenes folder. So I'll just fix that up there. And we want to head into our scripts folder and create a new C sharp class called player motor. And this script will contain all of our player movement functionality. So we'll open up that script. At the top of the class, we want a private character controller. We'll just call this controller. We want a private vector three for our player velocity. And we want a public float for our speed. And we'll set this to equal something like five. Now we wanna assign our controller in start. So controller is equal to get component character controller. Now we want to create a new public void method and we'll call this process move. This will take in a vector two, which we'll call input. Now what this function is going to do is receive the inputs from our input manager 
script and apply them to our character controller. So in here, we want a local vector three and we'll call this move direction. And we can set this to vector three dot zero. Then we want to set move direction dot X to equal input dot X. And we want move direction dot Z to equal input dot Y. So what we're doing is we're grabbing the Y component of the 2D vector and applying that to the Z axis of our character. So we're translating that vertical movement into forward backward movement. Then all we need to do is call the move function on our character controller. So controller.move. And in here we want to pass in transform.transform direction. In this we'll pass in our move direction. And then we'll multiply the result of that by speed times time dot delta time. Now we'll save that, head back into our input manager script. And we're going to create a property for our player motor script. So at the top of the class, we want a private player motor and we'll call this motor. We'll assign it in the awake function. Motor is equal to get component player motor. And then we want to change update to fixed update. And in here, we'll tell the player motor to move using the value from our movement action. We can do this by typing motor dot process move. And in here, we'll pass in on foot dot movement. And we can read the value by typing in read value. And the value we are going to be reading in is a vector two. And there you go. We'll save our script, head back into Unity. We can drag our scripts onto our player. Now let's head up to Window. Under Analysis, we'll open up the Input Debugger. And this will open up a window that's going to show all of the devices you have currently attached to your computer. On mine, I've got keyboard and mouse, a Wacom pen, and an Xbox controller. So if I open up the keyboard window over here and hit play, we'll move forward. You can see that it's registering that I pressed the W key. Now if I move backwards, you can see it registers the S key. So the input debugger is an incredibly helpful new feature, which displays the current inputs Unity is receiving. So now if I open up the Xbox controller window and move forward on the left stick, you can see that the player is moving with the controller as well. Perfect, but not quite. Because if I close these windows, head into the scene view and lift our player just above the ground, you can see that they are not falling back down. So we're not finished yet, we still need to add in gravity. So we'll stop playing there, head back into our player motor script, and at the top we'll create a new private boolean, and we'll call this is grounded. Now we also want a public float for our gravity. Gravity is usually set to negative 9.8. Now we'll head back down into our process move function, and we want to set the player velocity dot y plus equal to gravity times time dot delta time. Now this will apply a constant downward force to our player, but that force will keep accumulating every frame even when we are grounded. So we can test this out by calling move on our controller once more and passing in player velocity times time dot delta time. We'll also debug our player velocity dot y to see how much force is being applied to our player. So we'll head over into console and hit play. You can see that the downward force is just growing and growing. Now that's not an ideal functionality because if we're trying to jump with a force of 10, then a downward force of negative 70 is just going to keep our player stuck to the ground. So to fix this, we wanna make sure that we are assigning is grounded to equal controller dot is grounded. So we are getting that every single frame. Then in between applying gravity and telling our controller to move, we can check if is grounded and our player velocity dot y is less than zero. Then we can just set our player velocity dot y to a small negative value like negative two. Now, if we save that and go back and test again, we'll hit play. You can see that the downward force in our player is at a constant value of negative two. And that's great. That's exactly what we want. We'll head back into our player motor script 
and at the top we'll create a new public float for our jump height. We'll set this to be a value of 3, and then we can head all the way down to the bottom of the script and create a new public void function called jump. Now in jump we first want to check if our player is grounded. Then we can set our player velocity dot y to equal math f dot square root. And in here we'll pass in jump height times minus three times gravity. Now we can save that, head over into our input manager and subscribe our jump function to the jump action. To do this in our awake function, we can just type in on foot dot jump dot performed is plus equal to ctx and then we'll create a pointer to our motor.jump function. Now this syntax might be a little bit confusing if you're not familiar with events, but basically what we're doing is anytime our onfoot.jump is performed, we're using a callback context or CTX to call our motor.jump function. All of our actions have three states that we can subscribe code to. We've got performed, we've got started, and we've got cancelled. So depending on what type of functionality you're going for with a particular action, we'll change the callback context that you are listening for. For our jump function, we're listening for performed. So we'll save that and we'll head back into Unity. And if I hit play, now we can walk around and we can jump. Oh, the jumping is a little bit too high. So we can lower our jump height here down to something like 1.5. Okay, awesome. Now we want to give our player the ability to look around. Back in our player input asset, we'll create a new action and we'll call this look. We want to change the action type to be value and we want to change the control type to be a vector two. We'll add in an extra binding and we'll set the first binding to be the delta of the mouse position and we'll set the second binding to be the right stick of the gamepad. We'll save our asset, head back into our project folder, and we'll create a new c -sharp script called player look. We'll make sure to drag this script onto our player, and we'll open it up in our code editor. Now at the top of the class, we want a public property for our camera, and we can just call this cam, a private float for our x rotation, and we'll set this to equal zero f. Now we also want two public floats, one for our X sensitivity. We'll set this to equal 30. And one for our Y sensitivity. And we'll set that to equal 30 as well. We'll get rid of start and update and we'll replace that with a public void function called process look. This just like our process move function, we'll take in a vector two and we'll call this input. And in here, we want to create a local float for our mouse X. We'll set this to equal input.x and a local float for our mouse Y, which will equal input.y. Now we can calculate the camera rotation for looking up and down. To do this, we can type in X rotation is minus equal to mouse Y times time dot delta time and then we can multiply the whole thing by Y sensitivity. And we also want to clamp the X rotation. So X rotation is equal to math F dot clamp. And the first parameter is the value we're clamping. The second parameter is the minimum value that we want it to be, which is minus 80. And the third parameter is the max. So we're clamping the X rotation value between minus 80 and 80. Now we can apply this to our camera's transform. We'll get our camera dot transform dot local rotation and we'll set this to equal quaternion dot euler and the value we're going to be passing is the x rotation on the x axis and zero for the other two axes now finally for our process look function we just need to rotate our player to look left and right and because this script is on our player game object all we need to do is type in transform dot rotate vector three dot up and we'll times this by mouse x times time dot delta time and then we'll multiply the whole thing by x sensitivity okay that's all we need for our process look function we'll save that 
We'll head back into our input manager. We'll create a private property for our player look script. Call it look. We'll make sure that we assign that in the awake function here. Look is equal to get component player look. And then we can do basically the same thing that we did with our motor.process move. But instead of doing it in fixed update, we want to do it in late update. So void late update. So we can just duplicate this line of code, paste it into late update, and we can change motor to look, change process move to process look, and change our movement action to be our look action. So now we're passing in the value from our look action into our player look script and running all of our code in that script there. And that's it. Let's head back into Unity and pop our camera into our player look script, hit play, and let's see if it works. All right, awesome. So now we've got a character controller that can walk around, that can look around, and they can jump as well. So that's everything that we're going to cover in this video. But I've also gone ahead and given the player the ability to sprint and crouch using this code here. So have a go at setting this up for yourself. I hope you found this video useful. Remember, if you have any questions or difficulties, just let me know in the comments section and I'll do my best to help you out. And in the next video, we're going to continue on by creating a really robust interaction system. So stick around and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching.